We're just praising the Lord on this Father's Day. This is a very important day. It represents God the Father. If you have your Bible today, we want to say that praise the Lord for the Bible. The Holy Scriptures represent God's rock. We know that the Bible said prophetically that Christ, when he comes back, he is called a rock. Coming of stone, he's called the smiting stone. And Daniel, in his prophecy with Nebuchadnezzar, says that Christ will come back. Jesus said, I'm coming back. And uh, so we know that he is the rock, he's the stone that's returned back to the earth, the smiting stone. And when he comes, he's setting up the kingdom, and the kingdom we call the kingdom of God, and the kingdom of heaven lasts for a thousand years, and then goes on into eternity with the celestial city. I remind you today that we have all the answers that we ever want to look for. These answers are right here in the Bible. Called the Rock of Ages, the precious word of God. We're trying to accentuate the Bible because we know that one of the factors that God gave us at the end, he said, I'm going to send you uh, some signs and wonders. And when these signs and wonders come, you will know that the end is coming and that I'm, I'm going to be back on the earth uh, during a particular generation, a period of maybe some 70 years. And uh, during that time, I'll send you all kinds of signs. Jesus gave us many signs. He said you're going to have an unusual increase in earthquakes. They're going to get bigger, more intense. Uh, the tornadoes are going to become more numerous. They're going to get larger. You're going to go, you know, one, two, three, four, fives, and they're going to go, like the last one was a mile and three quarters wide, devastated. So we're seeing all the different things that Jesus said, the prophets have said. Of course, one thing that he said was, at the end, uh, I'm going to send you a delusion. This is uh, something that God is doing. I'm going to do it. That's Paul looked at. Paul will tell. And the delusion is going to get everybody away from the Bible and the church. So today at the Baptist Temple, we're in the Bible. We believe that the Holy Scriptures, and we like to retain the King James because it's, it may be the oldest or the archaic, but it's the most accurate, we believe. And so we still stay with the King James. And I hope you'll appreciate the reading of the Scriptures today because uh, that is what God is organizing the planet Earth on. And without that, we have much, much hope. Uh, as we look at the Bible, I want to remind you that the word Jesus uh, was a, it's an English word, but it's announcing, the angel announced that his name should be called Jesus, and then it tells us what his name means. Uh, the names in the Bible, many of them have uh, a lot of meaning, so by just knowing the name, you know a lot about what the whole thing is about. Uh, the name for God has got some 14 different combinations of names. So the names mean something, and the angel said, his name shall be called Jesus, he'll save his people from their sins. So we know that uh, in the Old Testament, Yeshua is salvation, and in the New Testament, it's Jesus, which means to be saved, Savior. He came to save us. And so, just mentioning that, uh, we have Jesus mentioning himself of the Father. And so, 250 times, Jesus mentions the word that he's equal with the Father. It's a lot of times. So you can't really think of Jesus as a Savior without thinking of God the Father, who has many, many names that we have. In the Hebrew, we have different names for him, or Shaddai. Uh, we have uh, Jehovah Adonai. We have different names for God, referring to God the Father. Uh, in uh, the book of John, chapter 16, uh, 12 times Jesus said that him and his Father are working together. He can't do anything without his Father. John chapter 16, 12 times he mentions that uh, him and the Father are working together. In uh, John chapter 8, uh, Christ mentions 22 times his equality with the Father. He can't do anything without the Father. The Father empowers him. And so it's not a Jesus movement, folks. It's a God the Father. Uh, and everybody say amen. Amen? So you wouldn't know that? So it's so important that you recognize that Jesus is an earthly name that's being Savior, but he has no power unless he does it through God and the eternal God the Father from the universe. Now we know that the word faith is mentioned by Paul. Faith alone is mentioned 400 times. Why would somebody mention that so many times? Because it's important. God wants you to be saved by your faith. It has nothing to do with your works. Your works will certainly be appreciated. God will reward you for it. Paul mentions the word faith for salvation 400 times. He mentions the word belief 300 times. So over 700 times the Apostle Paul 
is using the word faith and belief, and he only mentions the word repent five times. So if something is important, it's not repentance. Paul's message of uh, faith 400 times, belief 300 times, we ought to get the idea that Jesus came to save us by believing in by faith. Today. So I hope and trust that you'll have your faith in the Bible. But I call your attention to the book of John, chapter 20. Here's where we get life through his name. We don't get life through being members of the world uh, ecumenical movement and, and returning back to the Mother Church. That's not life. A lot of people have that idea today, that reversal of, of Romanism, reversal of imperial Roman government uh, with Freemasonry and of the uh, large uh, ecumenical movement of returning uh, all the Catholics back and the Protestants back to the Mother Church so we can have one new global government. That is a move that's going on. And that is a, that's been in the works for quite some time, especially since 1948, when the United Nations were formed. And then later on by our own country supporting these things. So what is life then? Is life outside of a building, outside of a man, outside of a leader? And we say absolutely so. In John chapter 20, verse 27, would you turn there, uh, look there, and see how uh, Jesus is talking. Now, he just got up from a tomb. He's been there three days and three nights. He wasn't smelling so hot, I suppose, unless he got all new skin. I guess he didn't. So with all that brand new body, I guess, then he came out smelling very clean. But into that, as he rose from the grave there, he meets then in John 20, he meets with his disciples. He walks right through a closed door. That's surprising. That scared him right into that. Chapter 20, verse 19, John 20, 19. Then the same day and evening, being the first day of the week, that's what we call the Lord's Day Sunday, when the doors were shut, when the disciples, they were assembled for fear of the Jews, they were scared, they were going to be killed, came Jesus and he stood in the midst and he said to them, uh, and began to talk to them, and they showed him his hands and feet. Well, uh, we have Thomas who didn't go along with that. He said, well, I won't believe. Thomas came in and Jesus was uh, seen a little later at a different time. So in the same chapter, looking at verse 27, you see what Jesus says to John. And we're looking at John 20, uh, looking at verse 27, John 20, verse 27. Then saith he to Thomas, the unbeliever, couldn't believe unless he could actually touch him and feel him. Jesus, uh, 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 Jesus said, reach hither your hand, reach, take your hand here, and take your finger, and behold my hand. I want you to take it and feel me. Now, you can see that I'm not a ghost. Behold my hands. Reach here your hand. Take your hand out. Thrust, put, thrust, place it into my side. You see the hole in my side? Okay. Don't be faithless. Be believing. See, this word believing is used, as it said, 700 times by Paul and uh, faith and belief. And then Jesus uses it 250 times. So where do we get all this emphasis then on the church and repenting? Well, certainly that's important. But it's also important that you understand that God used a thousand times the word faith and belief in the New Testament to get us away uh, from the rituals of water baptism and church membership that they had and all the rules they had in the Old Testament. It is important that we awake to this. But we have most of the whole world today believing you've got to be baptized to be saved. And you've got to hold out faithful to the end with some rituals to keep yourself saved. And that, uh, you know, just believing that Jesus rose from the grave, well, that's, that's not going to save you. Well, then why does he use it a thousand times over and over the word believe, 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 believe? Because he just wants you to believe. So look at this verse here as he gets Thomas to take his finger and stick it in his side and his hand. Verse 28, John 20, 28. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Two ways to express God. Lord, kurios, here meaning uh, Lord, meaning God, or Master, but here he's talking about being God. So very clearly in verse 28, he said, My Lord and my God, showing us that kurios uh, means God. A lot of times that word is used uh, some 500 times in the New Testament, being Master teacher. But here he's saying, look, you are my God. That's Jehovah. The I am. And 
course, that word is being left out of your new modern translation. They try to always hit on that and try to remove anything at all that shows that Jesus is the I Am and that He's equal with God the Father. There's a move on that. I hope you can see what I'm saying. So here, my Lord and my God, He recognizes here that God is the same as Lord. He has master, the teacher of Jehovah. Verse 29, Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you can see me, you handle me, you can touch me, you, you've seen the five senses, hear, see, touch, feel, you've got five senses, yeah, you're believing by your five senses. Thou hast believed, using your five senses, you have seen me, you have believed, verse 29. Blessed are they that have not seen. In other words, with their five senses, they've never seen the Lord Jesus Christ. They never heard his voice. They never uh, uh, felt the sweat on his hand. Uh, they didn't sit down and eat a, a supper with him. He said, Blessed are they that have not seen with their five senses and feel and touch or whatever. And that's you and I. That is a world out there of unbelievers. And God wants you to believe. Now look at the next verse. This is the capstone of the truth of the whole Bible. If you miss this verse, uh, you miss heaven. You know, there's no way you're going to go to heaven. You'll be part of the group that says, Oh Lord, didn't we do all these miracles and work miracles in your name? He said, Depart from me, I never knew you. That's Matthew 7. Why did he say it? Because there's a mass of humanity that's going to have to stand in front of the Lord Jesus judgment day and give an account for the fact they did not believe. See, he mentions this, as we said a thousand times, he mentioned belief. Where do we come off with this word repent? We've got everybody repenting constantly to be saved and then believe it, you know, later on. Repent and then, be, and then believe. Uh-uh. You have no power ever to repent if you do not believe. So you, there's no real repentance. You're just playing a, a, a mouthy game. You're just saying mouthy words. And I would ask you, this is the simplest thing. If a person is born again, uh, what, does a, what does a child do to be born of his mother? Uh, does a child go into his mother's womb and say, Mom, I want to be born of you? Remember, to be born again, the mother does all the work. The father and mother do all the work. The child does absolutely nothing. To be born is a gift. God has to born you and birth you, and that's by believing in Jesus and accepting and believing. Nothing more, nothing less. Believe, 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 believe. Say it a million times, would you? And kind of get off of this business that uh, we're being rehabilitated by your penance. And we're going to feel good about ourselves if we just join the Mother Church again and go back through ritualistic water baptism, which has no power to do anything like washing your sins away. It's just total nonsense. So we stand very clear on this word, believing in faith. And so what does he say in verse 31? Look at verse 31. Read this out loud. 2031. But these are written that you might believe. You might do what? Believe, believe, believe. believe. See repentance there? There's no repentance. There's no more baptism. Somebody called me yesterday and was asking me, hey Ray, when are you going to get baptized? Are you kidding me? You know? And so uh, I just listened uh, to the person and just said a prayer for him. These are written that you might believe, not repent, that Jesus is the Christ. It's pretty simple, isn't it? You want to, if you write your Bible, you're going to make it more complex than that? What are you going to put in there? See? So don't turn it backwards. That Jesus is the anointed Messiah, the Savior of the world, the Son of God. You've got to believe that. And that believing, notice, not repentant, that believing you might have life through his what? Through your baptism there? What's it say? Name, right? Well, isn't that pretty simple? Well, now I ask you something. Did you tell somebody this week how to be saved? You didn't? Why not? You're scared, right? That's right. You're afraid of it. You're afraid that they won't like you. You're afraid that they'll think you're some religious fanatic uh, because you tell them that, you know, that uh, you believe in the power of cookie. You know, the power of, of, of Jesus' body being the cookie and uh, his blood being the grape juice. You know, you've got that in mind. It says here, life is through the name. It's not through the power of cookie or transubstantiation of the body and blood of Christ, uh, which is a going back before the Reformation. Back to the Mother Church. Now in Galatians chapter 3, we have a word that's being used, uh, and, and I hope you'll turn it with me. Paul is writing here about the importance of these people. Look at Galatians as we read this, would you? He calls them fools. That's a rough name, and that's very 
serious, they're very strong. Here's a controversy. These people are being saved by repentance and by their works and a few other things. And that problem is uh, the, the people here are confused over church membership and over repentance, good works, many things that are part of the doctrine, what we call the doctrine of good works. Galatians 3, we're now reading ahead of it. Uh, chapter uh, 3, verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Now the word bewitched is a, kind of a, a satanic word, so they're being overpowered by that force that is invisible force, demonic, demons, and they use the word bewitched here, a powerful force of Satan to confuse the people over uh, something that they can do uh, for themselves, and by, that, by bringing themselves to be humble and repentant for the Lord, they're going to be saved. So they're bewitched. You should not obey the truth. Before whose eyes Christ Jesus hath been evidently set forth, he was crucified among you. This is only what I learned of you. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Once again, we're accentuating the need of believing by faith alone in Jesus Christ and resurrection alone, as we just read in John. Are you so foolish? Having begun the Holy Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Something that you can do for yourself? In other words, you're saved by your simple childlike belief that God is birthing you, God is saving you, God has paid for your sins and He has given you eternal life. Now, what can you do for yourself? Are you going to approve on that? In other words, can you now go ahead and do something, uh, work real hard in the church and uh, make sure you have a respectful attitude every day of your life? Is that going to keep you saved and make you more saved? Are you bewitched? Have you suffered so many things in vain? If it yet is in vain. Uh, so, verse 6. Even as Abraham believed God, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Notice he did what? He believed, he trusted, he accepted. Uh, he is by faith here. Over and over and over, we have the word believe, as we said. Paul uses it uh, with the word believe 700 times conjun in a conjunction. Over and over. It's a simple thing. Believe, believe. Yeah, Abraham believed. Nothing here about repentance. There's nothing here about water baptism. Nothing here about adding to what God is already going to do for you. It's so simple. To believe, believe. And he counted it for absolute holiness, righteousness. Know you therefore that they which are of faith the same of the children of Abraham. Verse 9. Uh, we have chapter 3, verse 9. So that they which be of faith are blessed with faith of Abraham. It has nothing to do with something that somebody can do for themselves. God has already totally provided his righteousness, his redemption, his sanctification, his holiness. He's given you his wisdom. All that is imputed unto us as a free gift, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 131. So you have righteousness here, and he speaks it here. They which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. And then he goes on, verse number 10. For as many as are the works of the law of Moses, the law of Moses here, are under the curse. Ah, here we have the word curse. Uh, the word curse means to be doomed or to be damned. Anybody who's attempting in any way to add to the, the, the message of salvation by faith alone in the great work of Christ to birth us, to grant unto us eternal life, some 55 times Jesus mentioned that in John, by faith and believing. And here we have much of the whole church world still trying to get people to do something except just believing it and saying it in their mind, yes, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And he says, you're under a curse. You're doomed. You're damned. Cursed is everyone that uh, continues to lie on all things which are written in the book of the law. You have to do all the law of Moses. 606 rules and regulations you have to do them every day, all the time, constantly, if you want to be saved under the law of Moses. And verse number nine, but that no man is justified by doing 600 things of the law of Moses in the sight. It, it is evident, the just shall live by faith. So once again he's saying that faith, believe, trust, uh, that is important that we bring everybody uh, to understand. It. Verse 13, Christ hath redeemed, redeemed us, bought us, paid for us. We were in slavery, we were condemned. He that believeth is not condemned. He that believeth not is condemned already. You come into the world. You're a child. 
As soon as you grow up, you become accountable for your sins. Some age, you know, 3, 5, 7, 9, 10, 15. At some point, Jesus in John 3, 18 establishes we're under condemnation. We're flawed. We're human beings. The best we can do is to fail. So don't be bewitched and, and get into something where you've got to add just a little bit to it. That's part of the great ministry of, the, of Romanism. It comes from all the way back when people uh, thought there was some way that they could add something to the church service and, and get people to be more saved. Christ hath, verse 13, uh, Galatians 3, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. Well, the law of Moses is a, is a curse. It's doomed. It's damned. And anybody that's under that, even if you bring yourself back under it, so, so what do you think? He says the word bewitched at the beginning of the, of the chapter. We're redeemed from being damned, from being cursed. Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. Jesus died on, on the wooden cross, torture. That the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. The whole world out there is made out of Gentiles. Where do they all come from? Where do all the Gentile nations come from? Abram. Remember his, his name was what? Ham. Remember God added it? He said, Abraham, I'm going to add to your name, Abram, I'm going to add Ham to it. Ham meant that I'm going to include all the nations. Abram was, you're going to save the Jewish people. By adding Ham to Abram's name, it became Abraham. He's going to save all the nations. We're the Gentiles. All the nations. Well, how do you save it? By the works of the law of Moses? Of course not. We're not being brought under it. Just like uh, uh, when, when they saw Jesus, it was, Jesus said, take your hand, Thomas, and put it in my side. Just believe. And, uh, well, we've added an awful lot to that. So it's under a curse. Verse 14 says, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, nothing through the church, nothing through the ritual, baptism, transubstantiation of the body or the blood of Christ, we've added that. We might receive the Spirit uh, through faith. So important just to accept the simplicity of faith in the blood, the payment of Jesus for our sins. One of the things that God wants all of us to do is that we assimilate uh, this idea how is it that you can receive Jesus? It's right here, it's in your head, it's in your thinking. And of course we call it the emotions, the heart of man. We mix that up, but uh, in your thinking, you have to internalize, you have to get into your mind, internally in your mind, in your thinking, that the blood of Jesus Christ, not the physical blood, not the physical water baptism, but the precious blood of Jesus. And that's what you do. You take that into your mind, you internalize that, and that becomes the uh, internal, by faith, the great work of the blood of Jesus Christ, by internalizing in your mind, not by some physical manifestation of blood and water or a wooden cross around your neck hanging down. But just as Jesus is being put to death in his trial by crucifixion, he, uh, he makes something very clear, and hopefully this clears up all the confusion about what it means to be uh, instantaneously given eternal life uh, through the great sacrifice of, of Jesus paying for our sins. Luke 23, would you turn it please, Luke 23, 21. Here's the actual details of the pain and suffering that Jesus went through when they were yelling and screaming at him. Luke uh, 23, 21. They cried saying, crucify him, crucify him. Notice they were crying, they were screaming, they were yelling. They were shouting. This is the mob scene. How terrifying this would be if it happened to be you. And so he's at trial, and instead of the court being orderly, it's totally out of, out of place, and they're yelling and screaming, and they want him to be uh, nailed painfully on a wooden cross. Verse 22, Pilate then begins to talk. He said unto them for the third time, What evil hath he done? What, what, what's the matter? I don't understand. Why do you want me to crucify him? What did he do that was so wrong? I have found no cause of death in him. I'll therefore chastise him. I'll whip him. You know, we'll give him 150 lashes. I'll let him go. And they were instant with loud voices. They began to scream, cry, and yell, and carry on. They were going to burn down the, uh, uh, the temple building. They were ready to overthrow the entire government. They were required that he be crucified. And the voices of them and the chief priests, these are the leaders. Everyone was yelling and screaming and carrying on. He has to be tormented. We have to put him on the cross. We have to nail him there. And so they prevailed. Pilate gave sentence, verse 24, that it should be as they required. And then, of course, verse 32, we have the final moments. And there
there were also two other malefactors, two other criminals. Now they had been caught, they knew they were guilty. There was no doubt these were major criminals. They had been put on only number ten, uh, number one uh, in the ten most wanted list. And uh, these were two, two criminals, and they were going to be put to death. Verse 33. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, another place, the place of the skull, the hill called Mount Calvary, there they crucified him, they tormented him, slowly to death, crucified him, to be tormented slowly, painfully, excruciating pain. And the malefactors, the criminals, there was one on the right hand, the other on the left. And they said, and then said Jesus, here's a problem the statement that has more power than any other statement ever been made by anyone, God or man. Here's this wonderful statement that Jesus said. 34. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They know not what they do. And that's the case of every single human being on this earth today. We have no concept of how this plant got here. We don't know the except that God said in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. See, God manifested himself and nobody's just all in darkness. I mean, we've got every kind of scientific principle and, and fact that we can talk about in the human genome, all the facts of DNA, the amino acids and everything that, that make up the chain, six billion nucleotides. We can study that very carefully in the field of biology and we understand it. And it's wonderful what God has revealed these last 50 years. And uh, gene transplant, gene, genetic engineering, the plants and animals and different things. But all of that is not going to help us understand who's this God? He's invisible. Who's this Jesus? Was he really sent by God? Is this uh, God himself coming and stepping from the Milky Way across the universe? And he gets right there into Mary's womb. And he's somewhere between a human and, and a God in Mary's womb. And he's got the white chromosome, so he's a, you know, he's a male. And it's supernatural. It's, it's God that's doing this. This is the miracle of the ages. That a woman is having a God man. This is not a natural birth, that's for sure. And he said, They don't know what they're doing. They don't know who I am. They don't have a God here. They don't know where they're going. Hell is real. Paradise is real. And so he tries to make that real carefully, very clear. And we close there. We read this out in verse 39, in the end of the passage. One of the malefactors, one of the criminals that were hanged, railed on him, screaming, hollering, If you're the Christ, save yourself and us. The other answered and rebuked him, saying, Hey, don't you fear God, seeing you're in the same condemnation? You're on your way to hell, man. Condemnation means hell. It's last it's hell, it's hot. We have been justly. We receive the due reward of our deeds. This man hath done nothing amiss. He has recognized that Jesus is sinless. Or he would be saying that. He said unto Jesus, you see, and this is a, uh, this word Savior. Jesus, the English name Jesus means Savior. Lord, Mm -hmm. Now here he's changing the whole state of things. He's referring to Jesus by this curios that had been identified as uh, the word Jehovah, called in English here, Lord. But, uh, this is the I am. This is the, the word Jehovah, the I am, uh, that Jesus spoke of many, many, many times uh, through the this entire text, especially as John mentions this over and over and over. And he's the I am, the same as a, the person in the very book. So Jesus, his earthly name, he calls him Lord, which is his godly name. This we believe is uh, transliterated into the word Jehovah, uh, the name for God of the Old Testament. And the Jewish people are under Abraham. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And so that's what salvation is all about. Can you believe that Jesus Christ is not a man, but he's also just God making himself known? He's a God man. Can you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Can you say that? Well, if you can say that, and really uh, in your mind while you're saying it, believe that he's the Son of God, or God the Son, either way, he said you had eternal life. And you say, no, I'm sorry, you've got to repent. I'm sorry, you've got to hold out faith. You've got to be taking the body and blood of Christ. You've got to be a member of the church. You've got to be ordained. And, you, know, uh, you know, the minister has to lay his hand on you. And you've got other things. People add to it uh, many things, uh, physical speaking and tongues and whatever. So we've got a lot of different kinds of doctrines, and Jesus said faith and belief, and he said believe and believe and believe, and that's all he's saying. So write your own Bible and create the whole earth and planet, make up your own plan, and then you can change it. But until you have to accept what God has said,
believe, believe some 700 times that they mentioned by faith in the New Testament. Jesus said to him, Truly I say to thee, to you, today, not yesterday, tomorrow, that very moment shall thou be with me in paradise. Now he did not go to the hot place, he went into paradise, and that's where he went. Jesus went there, because he, he went with him. Where are you going? Well, everybody's going to go. And where are we going to go? Well, we know that God later on, Paul wrote that paradise was moved to heaven. In Hebrews chapter 12, it tells us that all believers, the Spirit of God is with you, He's in you, He takes your spirit, He leaves your body here, your soul body stays here, but your spirit is made perfect in Christ Jesus. You have redemption, sanctification, you have holiness, you have wisdom, uh, and uh, God has given you perfect righteousness, Paul writes that, 1 Corinthians 1, 31. Four major things that we have the moment that we believe, not repent, not be baptized, not anything at all that involves you. Uh, the birth of the child is done by the mother, and that's a gift, totally. Life is a gift from the mother. To be born means that not the child doesn't do anything to be born. God the Father does that with the Holy Spirit, and you do that by believing. So when God puts that in your mind and energizes you with the Holy Spirit and say, I believe, that Jesus is the Son of God? Well, they don't, they don't add to it unless you want to write your own Bible because people are trying to do that, twist the Bible and add things to it. It's just not there. Too many times the word believe, over and over, by Christ and by Paul, hundreds of, hundreds of times, almost a thousand times. Jesus said, and truly I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise, and that's where he went. Uh, and so that's the point. And so Jesus way back there said, Father, forgive them, and they know not what they do. Uh, and I'm on verse 34. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. We have a mass of humanity today trying to go back into the mother church, trying to figure out some way that we can reverse the Reformation. The political religious system is coming back. The prophecies of Daniel are being fulfilled. The delusion is on the whole earth. Paul uh, writes very carefully in Thessalonians. He says, God is going to send them a delusion. This is not uh, just Satan doing it. Although he has a great power to kill them, to maim and destroy, yet God has determined uh, everything that's happening on the earth. God is with us today. God is right here in this church. Here. God is in, uh, in this country of ours and upon the, the television ministry we trust. So God is with us. Today, I'm headed with Christ Jesus by faith alone and believing alone. That's my salvation. Yeah, my baptism means something. My church membership, they do mean something. They add, of course, that they don't make you more saved, they don't keep you from being saved. They, but they do add the fact is that you want to show that uh, God is in your life and you want to do many things. You give your money, your, uh, you give your, your time, your efforts, you help the poor, and you feed them, you clothe them, you take them places, you do everything you can to help uh, showing that Christ is working in you. And those things you do because you are saved. They don't make you more saved and they don't save you. But if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, you believe and accept that Jesus is God the Son, you have eternal life. And if you want to do something more, then you better go back and rewrite the Bible because he doesn't mention beliefs uh, basically a thousand times. Believe, believe, believe. Can you believe? Can you say, I believe? God bless. Could we stand and pray? Father, we ask now that we close out our message today and honor it on Father's Day because you did speak uh, some 200 times in the Old Testament and the New Testament the importance of the Father and how many times Jesus spoke over and over and over in the book of John that he and the Father were one and we have no hope outside of the Father and Jesus being one. Our power for our salvation is in God the Father and to bless Jehovah along with Jesus Christ the Lord, the I am. In Christ's name, amen.